I want to start this vid by saying I wish I didn't have to make it. I wish the fuzz would deal with their own shit and call out cops who lie about the war on cops. But they didn't, so here I am. And I don't plan to pretty it up. And while I've been working on the notes for this vid for a while, recent events bumped up my production schedule. I'll get into that shortly, but suffice it to say, a retired cop is calling for open war on the American people, and my vid is going to go to some pains to knock down his points while also making some of the points I was already planning to make. It'll go over a pig named David Grossman, whose warrior training leads to unnecessary death like that of Philando Castile. Also, I was made aware by an associate that Kerry Wettler made a similar video recently. I watched it, and it's good. So I'll start out the gate by saying that if you want a friendlier vid to send to friends and family, share hers, and not mine. Because I'm nowhere near as nice as she was. I'll be including the facts from her vid that are relevant and linking in the description to her full video. Seriously, sub to her. But. I have a significant amount of gaps to fill in, and extremely relevant reasons to do so. Suffice it to say, shit's about to get hot, and Izzo and Grossman want cops on one side against the public. It's reckless, stupid, and dangerous. So let's put a wrench in the works, shall we? First, let's discuss how dangerous policing really is. If there's a war on cops, it must be pretty dangerous, right? Especially if it's a war they're suggesting killing people over. Except, no. Holy fuck no. Some of the most recent BLS numbers put policing behind these categories. Logging, fishing work, pilots and flight engineers, roofers, waste management, drivers and sales workers and truck drivers, farmers, ranchers and other agricultural managers, structural metal workers, construction supervisors, extraction workers, landscaping and lawn service groundkeepers, and literally more. And since most of the stupid motherfuckers claiming there's a war on cops blame Obama for it, let's see the 2015 numbers, cause why not? Electrical and power line workers, taxis, mining, support activities for mining, maintenance and repair, and cement workers all died more than cops. Like, holy fuck, if your job is safer than a garbage person's, where's the war? And that's just looking at the numbers uncritically. I wanted to know for sure what I was talking about, so I looked for numbers in one of the bluest sites on the internet, the Officer Down Memorial page. Here, not only can you find reports of officer deaths and see memorials from people who care about them, but you can also read how they died. A total of 121 in 2019 as of writing this vid is about commensurate with previous years by BLS numbers. In 2017 it was 117 and in 18 it was 127. We're in the average zone here. Showing is not getting worse. So let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. The primary causes of police deaths were in fact gunshots. Thus far this year 46 Leos died by intentional gunfire. That's the leading cause of officer deaths in 2019, but behind that? Automobile crashes. Lots of them. And if you read any media about cops, know the writer probably supports police and is defending them. I can't tell you how many times I read something about a cop killing someone and the writer of the article fucking skirted the ship by claiming the guy just died after the cop did the thing. Anyone else who has someone die after they do something would be called a killer, and it would be said that they, uh, killed someone. But cops get a pass. Same with this site's wording. In this case, they soften what happened by saying things like, the vehicle left the roadway, even when an officer drove poorly and died as a result. So let's go over these stories. This guy hit some ice, and his car went off the road. This guy went off the road and hit a tree. This guy also hit a tree, and he flipped the car. This guy left the roadway and landed in a canal. This guy took a curve wrong, and his car left the road. This woman also took a curve wrong, and her car left the road. This guy left the roadway, and he hit a pillar under a bridge. This 
particular piece doesn't say his car left the roadway, but it doesn't say that anyone caused him to flip. That didn't stop his vehicle from rolling over several times. This guy drove into a ditch and flipped a few times. This guy took a curve wrong, left the roadway, and hit a utility pole. But none of these really sound like a war against cops. So that's pretty much half the uh, accidents, the roadway accidents, that were just single vehicle crashes where the officer probably drove poorly and left the roadway. Now, I don't know if that's the case specifically. I'm not going to look into every single one of these, like, over 100 cases. If anyone else wants to do that, they can. But I'm going to go over all the rest of these cases and see if any of these also don't look like a war against cops. This guy collided with another vehicle at an intersection. He was on his way to pick somebody up. Uh, despite looking, I can't find any information about the woman who was taken off to the hospital. Um, but <laughs> such is the case here where this officer not only gets memorialized, but he gets to be the one named, and the woman he hit does not. This one was hit when a truck crossed the center line. I can't find any information about the driver, and uh, judging from the way the, uh, the, the truck looks, I kind of doubt I'll ever be able to know. But judging from that, um, this isn't a war on cops' death either. Much like the other one, we don't get to know any information other than the cop is dead. Which, yes, this is undoubtedly sadder than the other ones, but the idea that this is a war on cops must require intent, right? Nobody fights an accidental war. So let's go on to the next death. This one hit the back of a semi and spun out into the back of another semi. I don't see any way that this was the semi-driver's fault, so this is also not a war on cops' death. This one also hit the back of a truck. We don't get any details on the people in the truck, but we know that this guy got buried under some construction equipment. This guy hit a pickup truck in an intersection. Yet again, we don't get to know if those people are okay. This one was killed because a truck hit him head-on. In a stunning change of features, this particular piece lets us know that the truck driver died as well. The truck driver was swerving to avoid somebody who made a sudden stop to turn left. This guy got hit as soon as he entered a highway. Now, I don't know whether or not he was using his turn signals. I don't know whether or not he made a complete stop. We don't get to know any of these factors from this page alone. We just get to know that he entered the intersection and got hit. This one died in surgery after being admitted for injuries she sustained in 2015. So she wasn't even injured this year, but it's still counted on this site, so I'm reading it. And finally, the one uh, cop who I would say died in service of the people in this particular instance is Trooper Gerald Wayne Ellis. Uh, according to this listing here, he was killed in a vehicle collision involving a wrong-way driver on I-94 in Green Oaks at 3.25 a.m. That's in Illinois. He was traveling westbound on I-94 when he observed another vehicle traveling eastbound in the westbound lanes. He maneuvered his patrol car two lanes over and intentionally collided with the vehicle, preventing it from striking another car containing a family that was traveling in the same lane as the oncoming vehicle. Troop Ellis was taken to Advocate Condell Medical Center where he died from his injuries. So, this is the one, the one cop who died actively protecting people. In this instance, uh, hats off to you, Gerald Wayne Ellis. But it's still not a war. This wasn't a war. This wasn't a war zone. This was a traffic collision. It's still one of the most dangerous places in the world, is the highway and freeway system of the country. Traffic collisions account for a significant portion of yearly deaths, 
and the fact that they account in this particular case for about 10% of the total deaths reported to the ODMP, that is about statistically correct. In fact, it's a little low, ratiometrically speaking. So let's move on to the other death types. So now we get to a more serious section, struck by vehicle. Now, most of this section is more serious, and I'm not going to say it's not. Um, but none of it, precisely zero, implies at all to me that there's a war on cops. And given the fact that this is 11 more of the deaths out of the total, and that we at this point are at around 90 deaths left, the fact is, there hasn't been a war on cops yet in my breakdown. Just to get this out in the open, 90 wouldn't even be a war on cops. 90 isn't a war. 90 may be a tragedy in the eyes of the law enforcement officer community, but to call it a war is tantamount to propaganda. But let's proceed anyway with the first story and the honestly least convincing for this entire case, and that is Deputy Sheriff Jacob Otto Almendinger, who literally got out of his Tahoe and was crushed by it. He was pushing it up an icy hill, and he got out and got crushed by his own car. And they call this struck by vehicle. Uh, they don't call this accidents. Um, they, the, the, the site has an entire section devoted to accidents. But the fact that he accidentally killed himself is considered part of these ranks. So keep that in mind going forward. These ranks are even willing to include incidents where the officer killed themselves. Now, I don't mean to bring any less gravity to a situation involving somebody taking their own life, especially since he didn't even want to do it. But let's be clear, this doesn't support a war on cops either. So, taking that number at face value even is a mistake on this score alone. But let's, let's get into some other incidents. This cop was crossing the street on foot, and a car without its headlights on after sunset hit him. Clearly not his fault. He walked into the middle of the street and didn't see the car because the car wasn't following that traffic law. Um, but he was struck and killed completely accidentally. This isn't a war on cops either. This one's an example of a cop who had somebody stopped and got struck on the side of the road. It's a very dangerous place to be, but it's also a place cops happen to choose to be rather frequently and where a lot of laws that many people consider revenue generation efforts, especially on a quota system, which, oh, not all departments have, and none are supposed to have, because it's against policy, but so many of them actually do. But I digress. He was standing on the side of the road in the morning, and it wouldn't surprise me if somebody was looking into the sun, or had the sun in their mirrors. But I don't know the situation, so I'm not going to say so. What I do know for sure is that he was standing on the side of the street, and many people who do that get hit by cars. I'm not necessarily, like, victim-blaming in this case. All I'm saying is a lot of these struck-by-vehicles happen to be when an officer is on the side of the street. This one is no exception. You know all those officers who ran off the road, or sorry, their vehicles left the road uh, that we went over last time? This guy was on the side of the road and he got killed by somebody whose vehicle left the road. So keep this in mind the next time you read that an officer's vehicle left the road because this could be the consequence. He was struck and killed by a vehicle while running radar on President George Bush Turnpike near Dickey Road in Texas at 10.30 a.m. So, this is the kind of thing that happens when people lose control of their vehicles. And this is a recurring theme 
in this particular list of struck by vehicle officers, where officers have been killed on the side of the road because people drove like the officers who died in that previous section we went over. And yeah, it's not great for the family and friends, but this is a reminder of the kind of driving that cops engage in regularly and how unsafe it can be. So just keep that in mind. This is another example of a guy who would stop somebody on the side of the road, only this time he was pinned and so was his motorcycle. This is another example of a non-cop whose vehicle left the road. And in this case, the vehicle was a tractor trailer and it slammed into this officer. She died relatively quickly. This is another example of a traffic stop where a cop got killed while conducting it, only in this case the traffic stop was to determine if somebody was in the country illegally or legally. And in this particular case, she was killed on a service road. But keep in mind, some of these officers in the previous section were relatively far off the road, and some of them were in ditches or on trees or hitting poles. This happens. It happens frequently. So frequently that these officers were barely discussed by the mainstream media, the officers who ran off the road. And these ones that were victims of people who ran off the road, they get news coverage. Another time when a cop was killed while stopping a person on the side of the road, another example of a vehicle leaving the road when conditions weren't good. Same with this one, and this one. And this one's related to another accident where the guy simply didn't see the cop moving a cone. And finally, this is another investigation of an accident scene. Now you'll notice something. None of these are war moves. None of them. None of them have been established to have intent. None of them have been established to be done with the purposes of engaging in war. But the war on cops narrative is still strong. Keep this in mind for the following officers that I'll be going over. Because this is a recurring fucking theme. Where there's definitely something that happened, but where an officer can't prove that it was done with intent, or where the officer involved specifically hurt themselves. I'll be going over in the next section, heart attacks, which, believe it or not, are just as deadly to cops as being struck by vehicles. Okay, so now we get into heart attack territory. Um, Somebody's already been mad at me for uh, daring to say that cops should drive better and follow laws generally and also eat more healthily and they would like have their death toll annually. Um, they got very angry. Two, two people actually. Um, of course, they might just be the same person since they cropped up around the same time. I don't fucking know. But... I'd already made this point because during the research for this video, I read these cases, and um, it's hard not to just find a little bit of irony that the people telling us how to live our lives have this kind of problem with poor lifestyle management in their ranks. Because here's the same amount of deaths as the previous category, um, only in this case, it's literally just heart failure. This cluster in here, it's literally people participating in either their, their fitness test, their wellness training, or a guy ran a camp for kids as part of being a cop at a local school. So, these people all could have lived healthier lives, and they'd still be alive. And this is a really common thing with cops, is neglecting their health while they tell everyone else what to do. So, keep this in mind while I read the following cases. Officer Anthony Neri suffered a fatal heart attack while participating in his agency's physical ability testing at the Lee County Sheriff's Office range on, on Felix Romano Avenue. He collapsed while conducting an exercise as part of the testing. He was transported to a local hospital where he passed away. 
Same thing with this guy. Suffered a fatal heart attack while participating in the agency's physical fitness test. Fatal heart attack while participating in a defensive tactics training exercise at the Fort Myers, Florida Highway Patrol Station. Suffered a fatal heart attack shortly after participating in his agency's mandatory physical fitness testing. He had completed the testing and left the facility when he suffered the heart attack while driving his patrol car near the intersection of FM 3009 and Dimrock in Scherz at 5.15 p.m. This is in Texas. His patrol car then collided with two other vehicles at the intersection. So this one not only fucked up his own heart, but also two other people's cars, and we don't get to know how they are. So just, just, I'll keep this going. Supervisory Deputy U.S. Marshal Norm Merkel suffered a fatal heart attack while participating in his agency's wellness program. David Fitzpatrick suffered a fatal heart attack after participating in the department's wellness program. Suffered a fatal heart attack after completing a third day of leading the Port St. Lucie Police Athletic League's police camp. He was one of the camp leaders as part of his summertime duties as a school resource officer. The camp involved three days of strenuous outdoor activities, including an obstacle course at the Navy UDT SEAL Museum. Officer Brown collapsed after returning home at the end of his shift on June 12th. Conservation Officer Opie Barron suffered a fatal heart attack while investigating an illegal harvesting call. Chris Holsey suffered a fatal heart attack after struggling with the subject while executing a search warrant. So, this one's really interesting. He collapsed shortly after becoming engaged in the struggle at 6.30 p.m. Two detectives who were on scene performed CPR until he was transported to Harrison County Hospital. The suspect he struggled with was charged with manslaughter following the altercation. This is so fucking interesting, because the... The cause was a heart attack, the weapon was a person, and the offender is charged with manslaughter. So, I mean, Eric Garner, you know, I can't breathe. Cops get to mock him for saying I can't breathe as he collapsed and as he died. But Michael Hulsey gets to be the victim of a person weapon, and that person weapon gets to be charged with manslaughter for his heart attack. Because he's the picture of health. Just thought I'd get that out of the way. So here's another Border Patrol agent. Houghton suffered a fatal heart attack while attempting to locate a group of seven suspected illegal aliens in the area of Mount Washington, south of Patagonia, Arizona. He and two other agents had gone to the area after a ground sensor was activated, etc. The agents began to search for Agent Houghton when he failed to respond to radio transmissions. He was found unresponsive with a head injury, possible from falling on rocks. At approximately 4.15 p.m., due to the remote and rugged nature of their location, they were unable to immediately remove him for transport. So, basically, he couldn't handle the job he chose because his body wasn't up to the task. He couldn't handle taking, basically, a hike. That's what killed this guy. Bobby Jacobs suffered a fatal heart attack several hours after responding to assist at the scene of a barricaded subject who had threatened to kill law enforcement officers. So this guy was barricaded uh, in his home, and he threatened to kill officers if they came in. This isn't a war on cops, if anything. This is the cops coming to threaten a man with violence if he doesn't comply. Now, I don't know the incident. I don't know this particular case. But this is the first one where threats have been made at all. And it's not a war on cops. It's cops doing their fucking job. And this is another case of a cop with physical demand problems. Because he suffered a fatal heart attack while patrolling areas affected by the Saddle Ridge Fire, a wildfire covering over 8,000 blah, he had completed a 14-hour shift of patrolling parks and remote areas in the evacuation zone in the San Fernando Valley. So, he basically was out for a 14-hour shift, his heart couldn't take it, you know, and again, he's the absolute picture of health, and he collapsed. Not a war on cops! Still no war on cops. 
And finally, in the heart attack section, Deputy Sheriff Jose Blancart suffered a fatal heart attack at the scene of a vehicle fire. He began directing traffic after assisting the fire scene. A short time later, he began feeling ill and requested EMS to his location. So, all of these, all of these heart attacks were the result of an officer's poor lifestyle choices. Even the one where they're charging a guy with manslaughter, um, even though this is yet another example of a double standard that cops get to enjoy, that guy is, is the closest to a war on cops. Because that guy's the only one who actually fought cops. The other guy just made threats. And the other guy made threats when he was in his own home. As I assume this other guy was as well, having been subject to a warrant. So, none of these are a war on cops. And we're almost a third of the deaths through. A third of the deaths are already passed, and there's no war. That should tell you something. Now, before we proceed, I want to get this out of the way. There is an entire category in this list which the officers in question really were trying to help. And I want to honor this particular section because these officers were officers related to 9-11 injuries. Uh, you know, the, the thing that John Stewart was very upset about being poorly covered in 2019's news cycle. These officers actually give a shit. At least gave a shit when they were assisting the victims of 9-11. Those officers definitely got hurt by people who were participating in a warlike mentality. Now, there's a huge amount associated with 9-11 that I hope people check out, and you can go to the Corbett Report here on YouTube or BitChute or his personal site to find out more about that, because there's a whole new level of nefariousness to these officers' deaths because of the nefariousness surrounding 9-11. However, these are the officers in this list other than that one who literally played human shield for a car full of a family who actually did something valuable when they were getting hurt. Um, and this is just the list so far. You know, I'm not talking about the gunfire yet, but I wanted to make sure I got this out of the way because these people didn't break any laws or, you know, ethical guidelines by the thing that they got injured by. And I want to make it clear that I'm not just dismissing this entire list. But these are still not victims of a war on cops. That would be absurd since so many more people died on that day than as a result of injuries related to it. You know, it, it would be so absurd to claim that this list, this 10 people list from last year, is still the war on cops. So I'm not going to do that. And that means that we're down 10 more people in this list. So let's get to the rest of them. So now we're on the home stretch. Because I'm going to go over briefly the other stuff, but I'm not going to spend the next hour yammering about gunfire deaths and the actual assaults that are listed. So I'm going to go over these, and then I'm going to tally up exactly how many of these deaths were actually somehow linkable to a potential war on cops. Because that's what's alleged here. And right now, the allegation ain't looking good. So let's look at the next 11 cases, starting with Deputy Jailer Michaela Smith. She succumbed to injuries sustained during a defensive tactics training in Whitfield County. So basically, she got hit in the head while pepper sprayed, and she checked in a medical when she was starting to show signs and symptoms of a head injury. Keep in mind, this is during training. It's not a war, unless the war is the department's war against its cadets. So keep that in mind. This is the inadvertent gunfire section a two-cop section of this site's yearly honor roll where they go over the friendly fire that 
kills cops. In this particular case, they were struggling for a weapon somebody else was carrying, and a cop accidentally shot a fellow cop. That's what happened. Over here, a similar thing happened, only in this case, a cop accidentally shot a fellow cop because he thought another guy had a weapon. Turns out it was a fake. In this case, a cop got killed by somebody who pulled out in front of him. In this case, a cop got killed by a faulty boiler at a jail he worked at. In this case, <clears throat> in this case, another one died during a training exercise, and another one died in a training exercise, and one died of treatment for injuries sustained while on duty. Another one just collapsed while taping off a crime scene. The last two are one guy who couldn't swim, and another guy who got hit by debris from a nearby parts failure on a truck. Now keep in mind, none of these have anything to do with a war on cops. None of them so far. And you know how many that is? 66. That's how much. That's how much hasn't been a war on cops. And that's even just assuming that the rest of them were 100% legitimate. 100% in the cops' favor. Only 55 of these incidents, 55 of these incidents listed on this pro-cop page, this bluest site on the internet, like I called it the other day, 55 of them, if they're 100% legitimate, if the cops didn't initiate them, if they weren't related to some bullshit charge, if they were all legitimate and were completely in that vein, of a war on cops where people just wanted to kill cops just for the sake of killing cops. All of those, all of them, all 66 that I just went over, aren't a war on cops. 55 deaths a year? Let's say this is average, because I looked at the numbers and it's pretty much average. Let's say this is average. An average of 55 deaths a year is not a war. Hate to break... Well, no, I don't hate to break it to you. It's not a war. You're wrong. Stop saying that. But here's where we get into the shit part of this. Because this lie, this obvious pandering bullshit, is used to justify what I'm about to talk about. Now that that's out of the way, check this out. A statistical breakdown conducted by Vitana.org proves a variety of things. Cops kill civilians at about 4.5 times the rate they're killed, much less by civilians. They report a decade average of 1,058 people killed by cops per year, along with a total death count average of 151 per year for cops. If my analysis of this year's numbers are any indication of past numbers, cops are about 10 times as likely to kill civilians as they are to be killed by them. It also highlights that 2016 saw the most cop deaths in five years at 135, but it only says 21 were out of ambush, and there hasn't been as many cop deaths per year since. Still think this is a war? Also, Vitana reported that violent crime wasn't a factor in the incidence of police brutality. Additionally, 69% of black victims were non-violent offenders, meaning victimless, and were unarmed, and police kill black people at higher rate than the national murder rate. So if there is a war, who's the aggressing nation? To answer that, let's look at hard numbers. Washington Post has a tracker for total amount of people who've been shot and killed by police for the past three years. In 2017, police killed 986 people. At least 69 of them were unarmed. 26 were armed with a toy. At least 237 were mentally ill. 326 were under 30. In 2018, police killed 992 people. At least 47 people were unarmed. 34 were armed with a toy. At least 214 people were mentally ill, 299 were under 30. So far in 2019, police killed 896 people, at least 37 were unarmed, 
25 were armed with a toy. At least 163 were mentally ill. 257 were under 30. So cops are killing a thousand civilians yearly by way of average, and the amount intentionally killed doesn't even reach 1,000 by the most generous estimates in total in decades. And there's a war on them? Fuck you if you even remotely think this. And to add to that, Vox reported on a study by RTI International stating that a 2015 study by RTI International which conducted the analysis for the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that from 2003 to 2009 and 2011 ARD captured approximately 49% of people killed by police while SHR captured 46%. Neither system picked up about 28% of law enforcement homicides in the US meaning more than one quarter of police caused deaths weren't tracked at all under ARD or SHR. Police are killing in even higher numbers than reported, which might be why The Guardian had to start setting the standards for tracking them. In 2016, the project The Counted reported 1,093 people killed by police. At least 170 were unarmed. 187 were under 24. It also lists deaths in 2015. 1,146 people were killed by police. 235 were unarmed. 206 were under 24. Guardian also reported accurately that, quote, U.S. police kill more in days than other countries do in years, unquote. Another project, this time the 2017 Police Violence Report from Words to Action in their Mapping Police Violence Report, said 1,147 people were killed in 2017. They map all killings, not just shootings, which they say accounted for 92% of deaths that year. They report that officers were charged with a crime in only 13 cases. Not 13%, mind you, but 13 total which means the government thought the rest were fucking reasonable. In the 569 cases from which they were able to ID officers, at least 14 had shot or killed someone before, and 12 had done it multiple times. Most of them were victimless offense stops, and 89 were in traffic stops. In the 170 cases where the suspect had nothing more than a knife, cops killed 69% of them without attempting anything less than lethal. And even though half were armed with a gun, one in five of those weren't threatening. It's real fucking funny that cops, who are almost always armed, get to call someone having a gun an excuse to kill hundreds of them, and that's not a war on the citizens, but when less than a hundred of them die by gunfire, they're being assailed by war. So you'll notice a theme. The more accountability police have been held to, the lower their kill count. Only nine cases in 2017 had video evidence, and cops have a wild propensity to turn off their body-worn cameras at, uh, convenient moments. Now that more people are flexing their rights and filming all cops, the numbers are decreasing. And you know what else is decreasing? Cop deaths. This year sees a decrease of Leo deaths by 23% as compared to the previous year by the ODMP. Cops are constantly bitching that anything they do could end up on YouTube, and a lot of them will try to quell a citizen's right to film them. Fuck those pigs. If you don't want to be criticized about the bad job you're doing, do a better job. So, why does all this matter? Well, a guy who literally teaches little man's Wing Chun felt the need to call for an open war on civilians recently. Upset with a war on cops for which he presents no statistical backing. First off, you have to acknowledge the fact that there is a war against cops, and there is. Um, I have said it more than once. War on cops. So you have to first admit the fact that there's a war against cops, and there is. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm laying the blame specifically this one at the black community, and obviously cops in their eyes go out to shoot and kill blacks on a daily basis, indiscriminately, whatever. I've... Uh, I've, I've solidified my position on their lunacy we are at a point now where if you don't take a drastic step at changing what's going on it's going to get worse one which he claims obama started he proposes a maximization of the force used by leos check this out here's my scenario stop somebody for using a tail light miss uh here's why i pulled you over she's got an attitude step out of the car miss she resists throwing handcuffs she goes and kills herself in the jail you're going to be scrutinized forever because you stopped her for bullshit 
for nothing. And they're going to say you escalated it. Versus 911 is called, you get there, drunk dad is, is beating his wife or whatever. You walk in, you crack dad's head open on the table. No one is going to say shit for it. You get a DUI. He's all over the road. You sit there and stop him. He stops. He gets combative. He's resisting. You break his arm to get him in handcuffs. No one's going to say shit over it. And all of this is within your use of force policy. A lot of you are afraid to go as hard as you can lawfully within that use of force continuum because you're afraid of what the public is going to say. You need to go harder on your use of force. Yes, yes. I do believe, like a v recent video I saw of a female cop, a, a guy, Hispanic man, turned, shot at her, missed her, she, uh, missed the, the bullet, missed her. She pumped 15 rounds into that car. Brilliant. Wasn't enough, in my opinion. I think we need to go back to that. Now, this, a lot of this stuff contradicts the stuff I've said in the past. But we're at this point now. Because I am, as of next week, one week from now, my certification as a police officer officially expires. Done. Done with law enforcement. So now I am taking my background and my position as a citizen. I don't have to responsibly say, well, here's the law and this is uh, department policy and this and that kind of stuff. I am saying as a citizen who's tired of this emotional battle with what the cops are suffering over, people want a war. They want a war on cops. You want to have a former president start a war on cops. People think that they can attack cops. I say it's time to bring the war to their doorstep and annihilate them lawfully and the right way. Now, to be fair, in the vid where he called for war, he also called for a drawdown on enforcement of laws of victimless offenses. Good. But the rest is a recklessness which will get innocents killed if acted upon. Dominic Izzo trained police in martial arts for years. He also has an internet presence observed by many a book and a cigar line because we all need one of those. He's living well off his actions, and recently his certs expired, and he's no longer a cop. Here's him discussing that in an Instagram video. Since he's a real boomer with how he films his vids, I'll fill the margins with this symbol he literally used on his site. And, you know, some comic book pages from the recent edition of The Punisher where he expressed his disdain for cops who act like Punishers. Over the last three years, I've been trying to make a law enforcement, a change in law enforcement that's never going to change. And unless I do my part on the outside, which is all I'm supposed to be doing in the first place, nothing is ever going to change. So if you're out there struggling with something, no matter what it is, put your burden down. Put it down today. I feel like I lost 250 pounds by getting rid of the possibility of having a title back. I don't see the purpose. I don't see the point. I'm getting reinstated. I'm a cop again for a nanosecond and then I'm leaving and I'm going to be doing the things that I want to do in life that are, are, are absolutely going to make me happy that I forgot fucking how to be happy in the first place because I was too worried about opinion. That's it. So, so whoever, the, I don't care whoever this uh, resonates with, whoever it doesn't resonate with, great. But if somebody out there is, um, is, is going through whatever uh, you're going through, understand we all know, we absolutely all know what you're going through because we're going through it too. And holy shit, when you admit to yourself that it's okay, life gets fucking amazing. Basically, now that he no longer has to personally deal with the consequences of what he's suggesting, he feels a weight lifted off. And he wants other cops to feel the same weight of caring lifted off that he did and wage war on civilians. An absolute model citizen, this guy. But he's not alone. An asshole named David Grossman has been promoting a warrior cop mindset for many years now to thousands of cops. He believes that killing should become a conditioned response to get around the inner child telling someone that killing people is wrong. Every species has this built-in resistance to killing their own kind. But the average individual reacts to killing like this. The first thing that happens is when you've actually killed somebody, there's this feeling of euphoria, exhilaration. Mm -hmm. You've hit your target. You've done your job. You, you've saved your life. You've saved your friend's life. It is satisfaction. Anybody who's ever killed a deer or their first bunny rabbit or whatever it is, when, when they hit it and it spins down, it feels good. 
But then when you walk up to that deer or that rabbit, especially the first time, most of us feel a sense of empathy for the creature. The Indians would ask forgiveness of the spirit of the deer. In the same way, when it's a human being, there is this feeling of profound remorse and nausea. Uh, and this is not just psychological, this is physical also. It, it, it's a physical It becomes reaction, very physical. Right. Many people vomit. All your life, you've been raised and you've been told, uh, don't kill anybody, don't kill anybody. We hold the ultimate punishment for somebody who kills another person. And then one day they gather you all together and they say, go over there and go kill those people. Uh, in the psychological world, we call this cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and so you do. You participate in it. The, uh, the social pressures are upon you. It's very intense. You go, you kill. You come back, and in the back of your mind, there's the child in the mind of every human being, and it says, I've done something very bad. I'm going to be in trouble. And you must be reassured that what you did was right and good. Now, you make the point that while killing may be uh, an inherent taboo, it's something that can be learned, and that, in fact, the military following Korea found great problems with the fact right. that only 15 to 20 percent right. were, were shooting right. to kill and started to develop techniques to increase right. Right. that rate. T tell us yeah. about this period and, and the t right. techniques employed. Uh, it's a fact, this incredibly low firing rate. So we systematically assaulted that. We applied all of the tools of modern psychology in order to overcome that. By we, I mean the Western in, the civilization. The inherent resistance to killing. We right. want the military sector, we must break this down. Yeah. And so what we did was, uh, for instance, in World War II, you would fire at a bullseye target. Mm -hmm. Today, it's operant conditioning. The condition stimulus is a man-shaped silhouette popping up in your field of view. The condition response, you have a split second to engage the target. The stimulus feedback, when you hit the target, the target drops. Right. A reward schedule are, uh, are marksmanship badges that you receive. And those so, marksmanship so that badges that becomes, becomes a conditioned response. That as soon as you see an enemy, right. you kill. And it's, it is straight out of B.F. Skinner. It is operant conditioning. We build that condition reflex in it. Uh, the police departments throughout America ran into a similar problem uh, in the 60s. We found a situation where uh, the majority, on many occasions, of police officers faced with a situation where they could and should fire their weapon would not fire their weapon. And we were losing a lot of police officers. The FBI developed a shoot-no-shoot no shoot program, which is very similar, in which a rear projection movie of a perpetrator in various circumstances would occur. Mm -hmm. Under the right cues, under the right circumstance, a police officer would draw his weapon and fire, and fire, and fire, and mimic that process, and it becomes a reflex. You've practiced it, you've rehearsed it. The, the thing to realize is there are two filters that the mind has to go through to kill someone. The first filter is the forebrain, the conscious, rational mind. It will put you on the battlefield in a certain place with a weapon in your hand. Politics will do that. Leaders will do that. Other things will do that. But the second filter is the midbrain. Once you become frightened or angry, you literally stop thinking with the mind of a human being. You turn off the forebrain and you start thinking with the midbrain, in the limbic system and the hypothalamus. You start thinking with the brain that's indistinguishable from a mind of an animal. You no longer become a rational creature. And what you've got to do is you have to go through this second filter if you want to make somebody kill. And the only way you make a frightened person react in a certain way is to drill it into them, to make it a conditioned response using operant and classical conditioning process. He believes that cops need the same social cleansing warriors get after returning home and likens the treatment of many officers to that of Vietnam vets. Seriously. To make matters worse, this motherfucker actually fetishizes killing. No shit, seriously. A Washington Post article by Radley Balco discussing a documentary called Do Not Resist had this to say. The directors attended one of the many SWAT competitions across the country. One SWAT officer reflected on his first raid. I was just trying not to smile. I thought it was so fun. I thought it was so cool, he says. Since then, he says, he always loves to watch the SWAT pups, his term for first-year SWAT officers, on their first raid. They're always just smiling from ear to ear. They're just on top of the world. At risk of stating the obvious, the officers he's describing are about to stage an armed, potentially lethal invasion of a private home. 
The most chilling scene in the movie doesn't take place on a city street or at a protest or during a raid. It takes place in a conference room. It's from a police training conference with Dave Grossman, one of the most prolific police trainers in the country. Grossman's classes teach officers to be less hesitant to use lethal force, urges them to be willing to do it more quickly, and teaches them how to adopt the mentality of a warrior. Geronimo Yanez, the Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Philando Castile in July, had attended one of Grossman's classes called a Bulletproof Warrior, though that particular class was taught by Grossman's business partner, Jim Glennon. In the class recorded for Do Not Resist, Grossman at one point tells his students that the sex they have after they kill another human being will be the best sex of their lives. The room chuckles, but he's clearly serious. Both partners are very invested in some very intense sex, he said. There's not a whole lot of perks that come with the job. You find one, you relax and enjoy it. He closes the class with a literal chest-pounding motivational speech that climaxes with Grossman telling officers to find an overpass overlooking the city they serve. He urges them to look down on their city and know they've made the world a better place. He then urges them to grip the overpass railing, lean forward, and let your cape blow in the wind. The room gives him a standing ovation. Seriously? This is the guy training people to kill. No wonder so many civilians are dying, while bitches with badges cry about a war on them. If they're constantly at war anyway, because they're warrior cops, the fact that so many people are dying is the goal, not the evasion, and it'll make you come better. Balco is an active opponent of the warrior cop mindset. He even wrote a whole book about it, which almost nobody has fucking read, which seriously pisses me off whenever I think of it. It's one of the best, most thorough cases against modern police tactics, and it goes over the history of warrior cops, including civil rights abuses, getting retired military equipment to do drug busts, and getting qualified immunity when they fuck up, which happens frequently. Seriously. Read his book. Damn. Adam Conover also went over the abuse of military equipment and SWAT, and highlights the facts that 7% at most of the raids suit the original purpose of SWAT. It's painfully easy to get one of them on the scene. They barely ever find drugs or weapons. They use unnecessarily deadly tactics and hurt innocents. That 10% of them go to the wrong address. That 80,000 happened in 2014. And that's all because of the kinds of things Balco brought up in his book. Read that and watch Adam's special. Can't stress it enough. So what the fuck, man? Where's this war on cops, and why does it look so much like the opposite? Well, another better retired cop has an explanation. His TEDx talk is described like this. Dean Crisp is a 30-year law enforcement veteran who proposes a new mindset for police departments. Rethinking police and community interactions can repair the often rocky relationship between law enforcement and those they protect and serve. He was a chief, and he knows what he's talking about for the most part. Here's him describing what a warrior cop is. One of the things that a police officer is absolutely equipped with is what we call a warrior mindset. Now, why do we do that? It's because immediately as a police officer is brought into training, we begin to talk to them, we begin to train them for shootings for tactical, technical scenarios. Now, that's needed. Because the job of a police officer is absolutely dangerous, without question. But what we need to do is have that police officer not just have that mindset that's only 5 to 10% of their job, but to expand their mindset to be inclusive of connecting with others. Now, I know personally how that mindset... Let's think for a second about the mindset of a warrior. And I know personally, because of being a police officer that number of years, I know how they think. What does a warrior say? A warrior is a person that is at war with something. Think about that for a moment. It's a person who has a siege mentality or a mentality to go out and enforce the laws. Matter of fact, if you were to ask police officers today, what is your main job? Overwhelmingly, the majority will say to enforce the law. But in reality, the job of a police officer is to protect the constitutional rights of all people. And you think about that mindset, how we front load them with those things. I understand that. Sometimes a warrior mindset can allow you to be an us and them mindset. That's the last thing that we need from our police. 
So why does he say this then? Well, he had an experience one day which made him realize what unnecessary damage his warrior cop mentality could do. I'll let him explain. So I had had this warrior mindset all day, dealing with issues, dealing with problems. And I remember having to park in the heart healthy parking spot. Have any of you ever had to park there? Well, I parked there, and as I began to walk into Walmart, I noticed that there was a young man whipping into a parking spot, and he had a blacked out SUV, he had sunglasses on, his music was blaring, and he was in a big stretch car, and I said, I dare you, no placard, no, no handicap pulled right into a handicap spot. My warrior mindset kicked in, and I thought, I dare you, especially since I've had to walk from the heart healthy spot. So I thought about what should I do? Well, immediately I began to think, well, let's write him a ticket. Well, I tell you, I'm the police chief. I'll just call someone to come out and have him arrested. Then I thought, you know what? You need to embrace the benefit of the doubt. Just go inside and shop in Walmart. Now, how many of you have ever shopped at Walmart? That's an experience. But shopping at Walmart angry is another experience. <laughs> and the fact that I was inside Walmart angry made it worse. So my warrior mindset had kicked in. And about this time, I'm walking around the store trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm still thinking about this guy parking in this spot. And all of a sudden, I see him. And I look and see him coming in the door. But now, I see him differently. And why? Because now he's pushing a wheelchair. And inside that wheelchair is a child. And I thought for a moment, good gracious, my warrior mindset coming into Walmart would have forced me to do something. So now I looked at him as a guardian, and I said, I'm willing to do anything I can to help. It changed. So what is his proposed solution? He proposes a guardian mindset in the community, a protector of the community, and one who remembers the cause he's there for, to protect people, not be violent by default, but to be helpful primarily. It's a great talk. Watch it. Share it with cops you know. It's good. It's really good. And that's precisely the problem. Ever since 1981, when the bitch-ass Supreme Court ruled police have no duty to provide services to citizens, then compounded it in 2005 by another bitch-ass SCOTUS which said cops have no duty to protect someone, even when that person had obtained a motherfucking protective order. I mean, let's get this straight. An average of 10 times more civilians are killed by cops than cops are killed at all. Poor choices and health problems which comprise over half the annual deaths included are on average, and sometimes it's an even greater ratio than that. Cops are highly aggressive, and many are trained to suppress their morality, and kill or otherwise brutalize on impulse, and ignore cries for protection. So that's exactly what they do, no matter the offense. There's a huge amount of money going to policing, and almost no accountability! But all of this is long-winded, so here are some fast facts. Did you know that getting killed by police is now a leading cause of death for black men? Did you know that by the numbers, police shoot and kill almost a thousand people a year, and that the number killed by police would be higher if they were forced to report all their numbers? Did you know that since 2005, only 35 officers have been convicted of anything related to a fatal on-duty shooting? Did you know that since 2015, U.S. police have killed over 1,200% more citizens than mass shooters? Did you know that cops have killed 450% more citizens in a three-year period ending in 2017 than four decades of mass shootings? Did you know that police are more dangerous to Americans than terrorists? Thousands can die at their hands over the last two decades, and the citizens are the ones waging the wars? How is that even possible? Pro tip. It isn't. And when they're not out killing people or threatening them with death, they do it to animals. The Puppy Side database has recorded at least 2,942 acts of violence since 1999, most of them resulting in death. It's hilarious to me that people got upset enough over Alinity and Brooke Houts to try and cancel them. But when cops kill thousands of dogs, people still back the blue. And when they do get home, they keep their work of brutality with them, with an estimated minimum of 40% of them abusing domestic partners. And while that happens, less than half of those cases get prosecuted, as opposed to the 92% prosecution rate for commoners. And many departments don't even have a policy regarding domestic violence, with no recourse for their treatment. Many police spouses stick with them, providing a lower-than-average national divorce rate. 
Sucks to be stuck in a bad situation and know that this system, which other people see as protectors, will protect your abuser. And while we're at it, let's also talk about suicide, because that kills more cops than citizens do. I guess if your job is to harass people, meet quotas, and kill to cure erectile dysfunction, you'd maybe see a little bit less flavor in life. Vox reported on the fact that we don't even get to know how deadly police are because they don't track the numbers. They can kill you dead, but some of them don't bother to say how many times it happens. You don't even get to be a number. You're less than data to some of these people. But by the data we have, cops have killed at least 8,500 people since 2000. That's more than twice the death toll of 9-11, and nobody talks about it. Buck! And while I'm hitting this, the highest gun fatality rate for cops for 55 years has been 280 in the 70s. It got close again in the beginning of the 2000s, but tapered off. Highest gun fatality rates cops endured since then was in 2014, at a total of 126, right before this imaginary war on cops kicked off and cops started getting killed less and started killing more. How can this be a war on cops when cop deaths have been in a gradual downturn for over half a century and when citizen deaths have been at record highs? I guess if this is a war, they're winning, and they want to keep winning. And keep winning. Winning like Grossman trainee officer Buckeye who fucked up an autistic son completely unnecessary. Or officer Grossman trainee Yanez who gunned down Philando Castile in his car for lawfully exercising his Second Amendment rights. You know, like Virginia is currently trying to criminalize. War on cops notwithstanding. And his gross ilk claimed to be the sheepdogs. Watching over a passive populace incapable of violence and protecting them from wolves. The kind of dog that will do violence to offend, not defend. What he doesn't say is the truth. The very mindset he uses to call the common human being a sheep is the same one that drives men to be his metaphorical wolf. And there's often very little difference between the alleged sheep dogs and wolves, if any at all. Cops do internal investigations all the time, pairing crooked IA and twisted pigs to a case where any sort of public opinion would be against them, and claiming they found no wrongdoing. Pigs held accountable are often once thrown to the walls, sacrificial animals as scapegoats for the sins of the force, and straw men for the arguments against police brutality. See? We handle our shit. You don't need to do anything. Bullshit. Meanwhile, Grossman says, We're at war. And you're the frontline troops in this war. There's only one way out. Don't be afraid of being sued. Shoot. And you will be vindicated. But when warlike conditions like those at Parkland are actually present, they're not going to protect you. They're not the good guys with the guns. They'll hide outside like Scott Peterson did. And guys who do stop shootings, be fucking careful. Or pigs like Ian Covey will kill you for doing that after they get there. And the situation's diffused. Remember, they're trained in escalation, and they'll do it. They almost always do. And they'll come real good and hard that night if Grossman has anything to say about it. Balco says this in his book. And it's true. As I've written and spoken on this issue over the years, I've even had current and former members of the military tell me they object to the word militarization, not because they'd agree with the basic premise of what's happened to police departments in recent years, but because from their own experience, the military is more accountable and disciplined than many police departments today. Several have even told me that military raids on residences where they suspected insurgents may be hiding have been done more carefully and with more deference to the rights of potential innocents than some of the SWAT raids they see and read about today. The police today may be more militarized than the military. Police officers are a protected class, one no politician wants to oppose. Law enforcement interests may occasionally come up short on budgetary issues, but legislatures rarely, if ever, pass new laws to hold police more accountable, to restrict their powers, or to make them more transparent. In short, police today embody all of the threats the founders feared were posed by standing armies, plus a few additional ones they couldn't have anticipated. But I digress. The point? No. There is no war on cops. There is, however, a war on liberty. A war on decency, transparency, humanity, grace, reason, empathy, and logic. A war being used to expand a brutal, deadly state already vastly less libertarian than the one the founders shot their way out of. 
a war against sense, subverting the humanity of all involved to avoid thinking about the deadly consequences of this war, and moving us all into a state of complacent servitude, wherein the state is always right and the common citizen is regarded as literally nothing more than a sheep to be herded. Step out of line and face deadly consequences, and hey, isn't it amusing that the ones who can enter your home without your permission search your car, your bags, your clothes, and inside your body, that is, when they're not outright sexually assaulting or raping you, beat you, shock you, put chemicals on and in you, force you to give them blood, break your bones, take your kids and more, all while getting away with it and have the audacity to claim you're the one who started a war against them? Izzo might even have good intentions. He's spoken out against police corruption before and been widely featured in truth or publications about his speech. He's said in the past he wants to bridge the gap between the people and cops who want to be in their service. He also got fired for backing Melissa Kalachinsky, a victim of police misconduct, opposing the drug war and exposing his chief as overly aggressive. He knows dirty cops, he knows how sick the system can be, and now that he's out, he's calling for those same cops to act like the Punisher? I mean, in his vid about getting fired, he even made the distinction that they're public servants, not public punishers. Now, every cop should just fuck people up? Yeah, that'll go well. If that becomes the new standard operating procedure, I'm totally sure nobody's gonna construct stories about violent suspects to excuse their action. Oh, wait! They already fucking do! And much more popular people, like Grossman, want them to feel good about it. I hope. Himself and any other cop spreading the war on cops myth will watch this vid, consider my thoughts, and share them around. I know there'll be an an I know there'll be animosity, but let's be clear, there always was. The state is a gang of thieves who gets what they have by violence. The military industrial complex Eisenhower warned about has paid for weapons of war, real weapons of war, not civilian arms like AR fifteens. And now those weapons of war are on our streets being used against civilians. It shouldn't be lost on anyone that the greatest period of disarmament has come alongside the greatest amount of deaths at the hands of police. They think they can get away with it, and so far they have. As Huey Newton said, any unarmed people are slaves or subject to slavery at any point. So, of course, since they can't totally disarm us all at once, they trickle it in increase the amounts of laws on the books, and massively increase the gap between how much force the citizen can use and the amount the state does. So my next message is to those civilians. There is no war on cops. There is a war on you. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Yes, since I started writing this video, six more cops died. One more of a heart attack, one more 9-11 related illness, two more ran their car off the road, and one of them hit a fellow cop car not wearing a seatbelt and was ejected from his car. And only one was intentional homicide. That actually lowers the ratio of cops murdered to dead by other means. And there's still no war on cops.